Well, first of all, it's a privilege to uh, be here. And um, let's just ask the Lord to have his spirit make things alive, okay? Heavenly Father, uh, it is a privilege to share how wonderful your son is. And Lord, human speech is nothing without the breath of the Holy Spirit. And so we ask you, Father, to breathe upon your word that it might go to each heart and encourage, edify, comfort, for that's the true spirit of prophecy. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Um, since we're going to be talking about something that has to do with water tonight, uh, I thought I'd tell you a story before. It's, maybe you've heard this. Um, it's about a young man who was on a cruise ship out of Miami and got out quite a ways in the Atlantic and before you know it, there's a storm and the, the ship sinks, but he survives. And he gets a piece of the ship and floats and you know the trade winds are blowing the ocean around and he ends up on this little island not much bigger than this room. And so he figured, well, it won't take long and he'll be found. And he's a Christian, so he starts praying, and he's, you know, trusting the Lord, and a year goes by, and, and it just happens to be one palm tree on the island, and a lot of flotsam and, you know, wood that brushes and comes in on the tides and everything, and another year goes by, and another year goes by, and my goodness, his hair's getting longer, he's getting thinner, and he has no idea, concept of time anymore, and 20 years have gone by. And he's still, no, he's so far out of the main shipping lanes that they, no one even, you know, knows that he exists. And he's still trusting God and praying. And he's learned to crack coconuts and catch little crabs and fish and survive and continue praying. And he's just wondering, well, maybe this is going to be it, Lord. I'm still going to trust in you. And about 20 years later, all of a sudden he looks out over the horizon. He sees the outline of what he thinks is a ship. So he doesn't know whether he's losing his mind, but he starts praising the Lord and praying. And sure enough, he sees the ship, you know, coming by at such a distance, he gets, gathers wood together and gets a fire going and starts sending up smoke like SOS thing, you know, to signal. And he goes, maybe, maybe, oh Lord. And sure enough, the ship stops and turns around and starts coming toward his little island. And he can't believe it. He goes from a dead Methodist to a Pentecostal and he's jumping around praising Jesus up and down and just excited and sure enough the ship stops and a little boat goes over the side and starts coming toward his island and he knows he's saved after 20 some years. And so finally the guys get to the beach and they haul him and he's got a beard down to his toes and his, you know, he has to eat his fingernails to keep him going on rocks for like a fingernail file to survive. He has no idea what he looks like. But they're looking at him, and they start asking him his name. He said, do you realize that you were on that ship that sank? He said, yeah, I was on that ship. That was over 20 years ago. How in the world did you survive? He said, well, I'm a Christian, and, and it was God Almighty. The Lord's the one who made me survive. I, it's just, it's his grace. He said, oh, man, it's a wonder you didn't lose your mind. Said, well, I'm a Christian. And he's given me my sanity and my faith, and that's how I maintain so they get him in the boat and they're taking him back to the big ship and the guy that's taking him back turns around and says, hey, can I ask you a question? What are those little buildings you've made there? Those three little buildings? And he says, oh, well, I'm a Christian. And the first little place, that's my house. You have to have a house. And so I build a shelter and that's my house. Said, well, what's that other little building? Well, that's my church. I love Jesus. I, I need a place to worship. Oh, well, what's that other little building? That's that church I used to go to. <laughs> he didn't lose his mind. <laughs> Uh, I, it is a privilege to, to be given the, the honor to describe and tell everybody how wonderful our Lord Jesus is. 
and what a good shepherd he is. And uh, particularly when we realize that he, that he picks us, not because we're perfect or he sees anything good in us. That's, that's what's so amazing. It's because of what he wants to do in us and through us. And I travel enough now and, and many people think they have to perform for the Lord, do things for the Lord and not realize that he wants to do things for you. That's why he created you. That he could show you his love, his faithfulness, his strength, his assurance, his forgiveness. Something that angels that never rebelled and sinned will ever experience, a level of God's love that even the angels have not experienced, his forgiveness and love. And especially how wonderful he is when we fail. He doesn't throw us under the bus. How many of you have heard maybe because we grow up in a fallen society and we grow in human love and parents are doing their best, but you should have known better. Uh, I can never, I don't know if I can trust you again. I thought, after all I've done for you, why did you do this? And Have you ever heard something like that or felt that from somebody? Whether um, we hope for, it wasn't a family member, but those kind of terms, you should know better. How could you do such a thing? After all, I've invested in you. That's it. I'm finished with you. I'll never trust you again. God doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. He's so misrepresented. And there's a wonderful example of how he treats us when we fail. Miserably. So if you would, please turn to Matthew chapter 14. And these are men that he handpicked to start planting churches and change the world. Uh, another misconception we have is be, he picked the apostles because they were so superior to everybody. And that's a false understanding. They're no different than you and I. They were no more faithful or perfect in their actions than any of you and I were in the beginning or are. And it's because of what he did. And their following him, how it changed them. It had nothing to do that they were superior in faith. And we have an example of it here that we're all, as James tells us, we're all people of like passions, like Elijah. We ha have our moments when Elijah had the, the faith because of God's spirit working in him to withstand all the false prophets of Baal. And then he gets a telegram from Jezebel and he about loses everything and he quits the ministry and runs in fear a day later. One minute he's got a high and the anointing of God with God working and just overnight he falls apart and quits the ministry, drops out, goes 400 miles, hides in a cave. Quit. A man that just was used mightily of God. And it says we're all the same way. We can have one minute, we're so excited in the Lord, we can have the faith, we can see God do something and the next minute you get something in the mail and that's it, I'm done. God's forsaken me, I, I give up, I quit. I've only got 30 days to get the money. Or the blood test didn't come back. I'm dead. That's it. It's all over. I mean, that's the way we are. But see, that doesn't surprise him. Remember, he knew each one of you. He knew you each personally, not only before you were formed in your mother's womb, but before he brought the material universe into being. When there was only the Godhead, there wasn't space or matter or time or energy. Nothing. Nothing. It was just the Godhead, complete in themselves because God is perfect. There was nothing lacking. He didn't need anything other than himself to be fulfilled because he's God. If he needed something, if he needed an angel, he wouldn't be God. He'd be less than perfect. So there was no loneliness. In fact, the word lonely isn't even in the Bible because God assumes, you see, that we'll believe what he says, that he'll never leave you nor forsake you. And you always have the three persons of the Godhead with you, no matter if there's another human around at all. The word lonely is not in the Bible. Because no one has to be lonely if they really get to know the living God. And so 
he knows all of our failures before the fact. So he's not surprised when Bill fails five years down the road after he's born again or after he's made the promise, I'll never do it again. He's never, ever surprised. I am because I don't know my weakness. I'm deceived in my excitement, you see, and my pride and my self-confidence. Like Peter, he, he never designed to, to fail the Lord or deny the Lord. One night with the wrong crowd, and just like that, he flipped. Just like that, one night with the wrong crowd, and he denied Jesus. But who's the one who did all the boasting and said he'd never do it? And did Jesus, did that stop Jesus from picking him to be an apostle, knowing that he'd do it before he did it? And what did Jesus do after he did it? He just looked at him in perfect love and forgiveness. And Peter's heart broke. He discovered himself. Jesus was not upset. In fact, Jesus said, you're going to do it in front of the other guys. And he couldn't believe it because he didn't have it in his heart to do it. He just didn't know his weakness. And one, one night in the wrong crowd with the wrong people, you can go down so quick. So quick. But that, see, Jesus knew it was going to happen. In fact, what did he say to Peter? You know, Satan and I have been having a discussion concerning you. And he has sought to have you. He wants to sift you as wheat. And he didn't say, but I'm binding Satan because I've called you to be an apostle and he can't do it. What did he say? He said, I'm going to let him do it. You need it. He said, when thou art converted, and I prayed for thee, Peter, that thy faith fail not. He knew that it was going to happen. And just because he fell, his faith didn't fail. And so when Jesus looked at him after it all took place, he looked at him in perfect love. He didn't say, how could you do such a thing and give him this anger or the conviction look or try to make him feel dirty or guilty and say, that's it, you're no longer an apostle, I'm done with you. I just spent three and a half years personally tutoring you, giving you revelation of my father. And I was going to trust you to go plant a church. You're done. No. He doesn't treat us that way. Because our sin doesn't surprise him. It surprises us. And he continues to love us. And the forgiveness for us has already been paid for on the cross. Not for the sin that you might commit tomorrow, but the sin that you'd ever commit. To the sin that people will commit that haven't been born yet and come forth from the womb. It's covered with the cross. You see. Or you'd have to keep coming back and dying again and again and again for the people don't live yet that sin. You see, it's for everyone. For the last human being that would ever sin. So, you see, he treats us a lot differently as our Father in Heaven than an earthly father, even though they deal in love, but it's so limited. And here's a perfect example of how God treats us when we fail. Um, he had just fed multitudes, and they're all being sent away, going back to their homes, and in verse 22 of Matthew 14, straightway or immediately, Jesus constrained or literally he uh, influenced them with his love and authority just by the way he spoke it. He constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him under the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And uh, I've been taking groups to Israel for over 30 years. That's normal, huh? <laughs> Remember, this is my first time here. And the distance that these guys would have to go is about three and a half, four miles. And it's actually on the north uh, eastern corner of the Galilee from an area which was uh, Tiberius across to Capernaum. Just a short little distance. Now remember, and these men are all experienced fishermen. Many times, I don't know if you've ever asked this, Lord, I need to know more about you. And it's amazing how he teaches us to know more about him. And here's an excellent example how these men are going to find out and learn more about how Jesus really is, what he's really like. And so, 
these are experienced men. They grew up making their living on the Little Sea of Galilee. They know all about the winds that come off the, you know, the Jordanian plains, the Saudi Arabian desert. They know the cold winds from the Mediterranean that meet above this little depression 680 feet below sea level, and it boils like a, like a putting, beating you know, eggs in a beater. And it can just take a, 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 the Sea of Galilee, and I've been on it when this has happened, as smooth as this floor, and you have six foot waves just in an instant and we've had to turn the boat back in and go right back to Ein Gev where we started out to cross the sea. That's how dangerous it is. But these guys knew how to deal with it because they, were, they grew up on the Galilee as fishermen. They knew how to set the sail and everything. That was their vocation. That was their learning curve in life. And just like all of us, you may pray and you might be right now in an experience because you said, Jesus, I want to know you better. I want to know more about you. And you're probably having the most difficult time of your life, personally and privately. And you can't get out of it. You, don't, you can't change it. You don't know what you're going to do. And the devil may be lying to you. He tries to tell you you're out of God's will. You can never be out of God's will. You are God's will. <laughs> or you wouldn't be sitting here. You wouldn't be saved if you weren't in God's will. You are God's will. And in his blood, he's made a covenant to keep you and to present you faultless, to perfect you, mature you, complete the good work he's begun in you, regardless of your weakness, your failures, or your doubts. You see, that's what we have to find out. What he wants to do for you, for us, through us continually. That our trust will cause us to enter into a rest and realize, Lord, you are so wonderful. How could I ever doubt you or your love? And see, sometimes where our greatest strength and ability is naturally is where God allows the greatest difficulty to teach us we're not as slick as we think we are. We can do our whole life and we can work things out, man. We think we got it together. Especially it's in our vocation and we're used to having it work out. I can just, all of a sudden though, the thing that I'm good at, the thing I've been trained about or educated in, my best strength, nothing's going right. It's like everything is against me. And then I start to doubt. Or the devil comes in and says, you're out of God's will. He's punishing you. And it's not even the case. You can be in God's perfect will. So off they go, right away. Notice in verse 23, when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. Now, a year earlier, you see something similar happen, and he got in the boat with them. So this time, their faith is going to be increased. They probably expected him, and they knew, well, I don't know how this is going to play out. The storm comes, he stands up and rebukes the storm. That's no problem. We'll just do it. He's going to, we're going to go again. This is a year later. This time he doesn't get in the boat with them. And maybe in your life right now, you've made a decision thinking God has told you to do something when something similar two or three years ago was so exciting and wonderful because you knew you could just tell his presence was there. It was very easy to step. I could see the Lord in this man. He's in the boat with me. But this time... Even though it may have seemed similar, it seems like, where's the Lord in this? How come, Lord, where are you? See, and he designs it because we've asked to know him in a greater way. And see, some of the greatest moments of knowing how good Jesus is, is in crisis. When I can't work it out. Mr. Slick doesn't know what to do. I don't know what to do. But I have been obedient to him. These men have responded to him. They're in his perfect will. <coughs> They've stepped in faith, obedient, exactly as he asked them. But notice, in verse 24, the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, and the wind was contrary. The devil has nothing to do with this. The Lord Jesus has designed it. He's the one that raises up the stormy wind. He's the one that can flood New Orleans to wake people up. It's not the, it's not the fault of the Korah engineers. 
the Bible's very clear that God's the one who controls all of it. Never put the devil in a situation when the Bible doesn't put him there. Satan has nothing to do with this. They are in God's perfect will, and things are contrary. Nothing is going right. That could be your life right now. You love Jesus. You've made some decisions in your life, and it seems like everything is going backward. Everything is contrary to my life right now. Why? Jesus, where are you? You're not out of his will. You've responded. You've stepped by faith. You trust him. But it says everything is contrary. The storm is against me. Instead of the breeze and the beautiful breath of the Holy Spirit pushing me forward, causing everything to be smooth and easy, like the evangelist told me, it's contrary. It's absolutely contrary. Yet you're in his perfect will. And it's most difficult because this is the area of your life that is really you've got to handle with. This is the one thing I'm really good at. Why is nothing working now? Why can't I get a contract? How come I can't get the job? How come I can't work this out? What, where are the customers? What, whatever it is, this thing that my whole life has been so simple for me that I can make a decision and work things out, it's always worked out. Now nothing. You see, and he designs things many times to show us what without me you can do nothing really means. No matter how educated, how good we are at it, and I could be the best computer salesman, I could be the best whatever, and all of a sudden, what is wrong? Why did I lose my job? How come I can't get rehired? What's the matter? How come no one will, I give the, I give the lowest bid on the contract, how come they don't take it? How come I'm overlooked? I'm a better guitar player than that person. How come they don't pick me? Well, how come And I go through all these things, emotions, discovering what's down deep inside of me, the way I can react personally and privately. So not only do I find out more about Jesus in my difficulty, I find out more about me, that I can keep buried because I can control things. It's not so difficult, I can keep it buried. And I can fake my faith to impress people. In the fourth watch of the night, so a 40 minute zip setting the sail correctly with experienced fishermen to get across from one little village to the other, which is normally 40 minutes long, they've been all night long, four and a half hours and they've gotten nowhere. They're getting nowhere in their life with the thing that they're educated best in. With the natural ability that they have, they're getting nowhere, and they're in God's perfect will. And it's not the devil. And it's not a lack of faith. They want to know Jesus better. Now look at this. And if you've ever seen a storm, I don't know if any of you have been to Israel, but a storm can come in 15 minutes. And in a calm night, the little Sea of Galilee is about seven miles wide. And because of that bowl, that natural amphitheater, the bowl of the Galilee area there where the lake settles down below sea level, it's like a, a beautiful amphitheater, and you can hear people talking in a normal voice on the opposite side of the Galilee. It comes across the water, and you can hear the conversation. It's amazing. But when a storm hits, it is so horrendous and roaring, you can't even see the sky. It's black. It is pitch black. Now here they are, in the middle of a storm, three and a half miles away from the, the seashore, experienced fishermen getting nowhere. They don't have cell phones to call anybody. No one even can see them to help them. 
And even if they did have a friend that realized they were there, the friend couldn't get out to them because of the storm. In other words, Jesus can cause a storm and isolate you even though you're surrounded with people. He, God has a way of putting you in a storm and no one even understands what you're going through or even seems to care because God has designed it. You are alone in darkness and don't ever get the idea, well, there's no love in this place. No one even cares. No one's called me on the phone. God can design things that no one will even know the storm he's put you in. He's isolated you. And you're in his perfect will. Now, here's the amazing thing. Every one of these men are the men that God has handpicked, taught them, and he's going to send them out to spread Christianity around the world, to tell people about God. Not one of them is praying, and they are the apostles. So when Jesus walks out to them, it isn't because of their faith. They're getting nowhere in the energy of the flesh. Getting nowhere. Not one of them is praying. And it didn't stop Jesus from coming to their rescue because they couldn't take any more. And isn't it amazing what Jesus taught them right there? Even if you believe not, I abide faithful. I cannot deny myself. He didn't say, why weren't you praying? The storm's going to last longer until you learn your lesson and lay a big trip on them about what prayer does. They weren't even praying, and he came to them. That's, see, for first of all, there's the love of God, the faithfulness of God when I'm not, when I fail. And you know, you didn't fire any of them after that episode. Said, you know, I can't trust you. You're going to go out and plant a church in my name? You, there's no way you're going. Of all people, you should be praying. And here's another thing they found out about Jesus. No human can get to them to help them. The storm is so great. He has isolated them in such a way that no human knows what they're going through. But there's no storm on this earth that no human can help me that can stop Jesus from coming to me when I'm not even asking for the help. I can't take anymore. I can't go on. And he knows that point, and he will come to you. And nothing can stop him. Not your lack of faith, my lack of prayer, my lack of understanding. It's his glorious love and faithfulness and the covenant that he's made in his blood for you, for me. No storm on earth can stop Jesus from getting to you at the right moment. And he'll never let you go one inch beyond that which you can bear with everything. It, there's a way of escape. And he went to them, and they weren't even asking for it. They just couldn't take anymore. He didn't rebuke them. He didn't reprove them. He didn't humiliate them. He didn't fire them. He let them see how loving and Good and what a wonderful shepherd he is. What a good pastor he is. The way he treats people that he's laid hands on that have failed. <coughs> and notice, when the disciples saw him, remember, they're going to go around and tell everybody what Jesus is like if they know Jesus. They've had personal Bible study with Jesus, they've seen miracles. They've seen it all. The blind receive their sight. The dead raised. Oh, everything. Demons cast out. And then when he does walk to them, and they aren't even praying for it, notice their reaction. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it is the spirit, and they cried out for fear. They thought it was an evil spirit. Oh, it's the devil. That's what it is, the devil. That's why I'm going through this. Oh, maybe the rabbis taught him that, that... You know, Job's friend, they, they misconstrued everything, and they judged Job wrongly. Evil spirits and things like that. Just because things are kind of, they're in his perfect will. They've stepped by faith. They have failed now. And then he does show up. They accuse him of being an evil spirit. And they're going to tell people, this is how you can know Jesus. 
See, don't put, never put a human being that Jesus uses on a pedestal. Never make some human that Jesus is using your Jesus. <coughs> You'll never get to know the Lord right if you start copying somebody he's using because he impresses you. The only one that can help you and I in this age is Jesus himself. They didn't even know who he was in their panic, in their fear. And he didn't even get upset. Notice how he reacted to it. Um, straightway means immediately, instantly, immediately. Jesus spake unto him, saying, I'm fed up with you. I come to help you, and you aren't praying, and you accuse me of being the devil or an evil spirit. That's it. I am finished. The boat's going down. <laughs> See, that's humans. That's human authority that demands and expects too much, that doesn't know how to deal in grace. That's why so many people don't even want to... I don't want to even find out about Jesus. I went to that church and I got hammered for 45 minutes. Jesus doesn't do that. Notice how he responds again to their failure. He comes to help them and they think he's an evil spirit. And they're going to go, they're representing him, remember. He's trusted them personally to plant churches. They still don't know what he's really like. Straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Don't be afraid. Boy, he's angry, isn't he? <laughs> See how wonderful he is when we fail? Because we don't surprise him. Remember, he designed the storm. Remember, Peter, I've prayed for you, and you're going to get sifted. <laughs> How easy it could have been for Jesus to say, Peter, relax, I'm binding the devil. I've picked you to be an apostle. You're not going to have any problems. No, he prayed for his faith. You see, and that's what he's done for each one of you. Remember, not only has he prayed for your faith, it, it says he ever liveth to make intercession for you. You see, he's praying for you constantly. Don't ever doubt, you see, that he loves you that he cares about you, that he holds you in his hand. And you know, it's a tender hand. It's a, it's a hand that the span covers the universe, but you know what makes it very tender? This huge, powerful hand that spans the universe and all the waters of the earth and the seas and the whole hydrological system and this atmosphere that he's created can fit in the palm of his hand. There's a scar in that hand and he's very tender the way he holds you. With all that strength and that power and that omnipotence is a hand that holds you and nothing can pluck you out of it. He says that. Don't be afraid. No anger. No evil eye to make them think they're a failure. Nothing but encouragement. Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. Ay vey. Ay chihuahua. He just told him who he was. Peter is the first pope. <laughs> He's the guy that's failing the most. Jesus just tells him who he is. And he says, well, if it's really you, prove it. Give me a sign. What, walking on the water, isn't that a sign? <laughs> you see... Don't put men that God's using on a pedestal because when they go down, you might go down with them if you make them their Jesus. Jesus never fails. He'll never fail you. <laughs> if it's really you, bid me to come under the water. And he says, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. As soon as he responded in his trial, in his fear and his storm, as soon as he responded, look at the miracle started being performed. His, his eyes were on Jesus. He didn't even realize what he was doing. You see, there may be some of you right now, you're responding, you're surviving, you don't even realize it, you're not sinking. 
until you get the next warning in the mail because <laughs> it's a week closer. <laughs> I mean, I, it's amazing. I look at my life and I, I measure my life. I had tremendous faith when I had 60 days to come up with the money. It's amazing how my prayers changed when I only had 30 days to come up with the money. Then when it got down to two weeks, I'm praying a little bit more fervently. Then down to one week, man, did my prayer change. It's amazing. The closer you get to your Goliath, the bigger he gets. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, if you don't come up with the money tomorrow, start getting boxes from the grocery store. You're being evicted. And what do I do? And yet God's the one who's controlling it to show you he heals never too late. Never. We say it to others because we don't have the personal experience or the trial. Very easy to say because the Bible says it. But see, God sometimes, for my own sake, gets it from here to here. And I say it differently. I treat people differently. I know a little bit about myself. And I know a little bit more about his love, his grace, his kindness, his tenderness, his mercy, his faithfulness, his power to be there instantly when I don't know what to do. I've given up. I haven't even prayed, and he comes to me. He doesn't let Satan have me to punish me or Satan to chasten me. You see, they, they had these wrong ideas. Because it was trouble, it had to be an evil spirit. Because things are contrary, they had to do something wrong. There had to be, God's angry. You see, all that has to be worked out of us as we grow in understanding of the love of God. Now see, if they weren't corrected in all these things, just think of the way they'd teach a Bible study. If they didn't learn what Jesus is really like, just think of the kind of Bible studies they'd teach. And people would sit under them and know that if something was wrong, you're out of the will of God. Or it's the devil. You better start rebuking Satan. And he's not even involved in it. So they had to be corrected themselves. So he said, come, and Peter walked on the water. And when, notice this, a wave didn't hit him. When he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. Do you realize in the, in the four Gospels, in the three and a half years of the apostles with Jesus, there are 77 references to prayer, not once in all the three and a half years, is there any reference to any of the apostles ever praying together for guidance or one of them praying individually ever in all three and a half years? This is the only prayer that an apostle ever made. And it's so simple. It says, Lord, save me. That's it. And he didn't say you didn't quote the right scripture and let him go down. <laughs> you didn't quote the right scripture. Uh, you're going to have to go down a few times. I'm going to teach you a lesson, Peter, in front of everybody. Uh, you, you, this isn't right. I've invested three and a half years in your life. You've been the head apostle. I've given you the privilege of being the chief guy here. And you're going out and plant churches in my name. You're going down a few times. In fact, I'm not sure I'm going to bring you up. There's a towel waiting for you at the pearly gates. Doesn't do that. It's the only prayer that any apostle ever made. The only reference to prayer they ever did in three and a half years. They were into miracles, casting out demons, raising the dead, getting people saved, hearing their name mentioned, all the excitement and all that. They never developed a relationship with the Lord like they should have. They didn't even recognize, they didn't recognize his voice when they were on the Galilee after he rose from the dead. You see, he doesn't expect it overnight. Your failure, your struggles aren't surprising him or discouraging him or angering him. He's not giving up on you. The wave didn't hit him. 
what happened? He realized this is impossible. He saw the wind and the waves. Didn't hit him and knock him down. His eyes were on Jesus and he was surviving. And he didn't even realize that he was surviving because of Jesus. And then he got overwhelmed, took his eyes off Jesus, and he started to sink. You see, maybe you're fine right now. You are, you're surviving. But the letter you're going to get tomorrow, and you see that you have to come up with this, or the doctor says that, or the wife says this, or the husband says that, or the school teacher says this, and down you go. You just see the wave. That's the way we are. But he's not like us. What did he do? Immediately. You can't get quicker than immediately. Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Now, what was Jesus upset about? What was the doubt? Peter thought he was going to die. Peter, Peter did think, this, it's over, I'm done. That's what troubled, that troubled Jesus more than anything. Not that their lack of prayer was evident. Not that they accused him of being an evil spirit. They would have to learn all that. The thing that really troubled Jesus, that he actually thought that, you know what, I've blown it, that's it, it's over. God's done with me, I'm dead. And that's what troubled Jesus. Why would you doubt You know, it's the fear of what hasn't happened that destroys many Christians. The fear of what might be, and they give up and sink. He'll never let you sink. He loves you too much. See, we hear it here. And, it, and if I'm not going through a trial, it's easy to say I believe it. Then all of a sudden, there's this storm in my life, and God in a supernatural way in providence can isolate you even though you're surrounded with people on a Sunday service. No one has a clue what you're going through privately, emotionally, the darkness, the fear. But he does. And he will never let you sink. It was immediate. He didn't make a gradual to cause him to teach him a lesson or chasten him for doubting. It was immediate to a man who failed. And all he could say was, Lord, save me. That's all he needed to hear. Probably the greatest prayer of the Bible. How, just think, Lord save me, and his answer to that prayer was immediate. That's what he was concerned about, that he, he thought that he was done, that, that Jesus would let him go and sink. And notice this, when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. Jesus said, they've all learned. You've learned more about me. You've learned more about yourself. The storm is over. And notice, then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, of a truth, thou art the Son of God. He's not just a healer. He's not just a religious powerhouse that performs miracles. Now, you are the Son of God. It, it, see, he was, he was declaring to them, he was telling them that, but it was all here. Now it's here. You are the Son of God. So I don't know what your personal experience is, but he loves you just as much as these men because you're just like them. They're just like us. And he's no respecter of persons. He understands and knows everything you're going through, and he'll never let you sink. Your misunderstanding, 
your wrong declarations, my rebuking this. And he knows it all. He didn't reprove them. What did he say? Be of good cheer. It is I. Do you realize that everywhere in all four Gospels, wherever there was fear, the first thing out of Jesus' mouth, fear not. And he even commanded the angels to say that immediately. If they appeared, and someone was already, the first thing the angels were commanded to say, fear not. You never have to fear an experience with God. Even when you fail. He wants to do nothing but prove his love for you, his faithfulness, his forgiveness. Let's pray. It's wonderful, Father, to have you teach us, sometimes frightening. But Lord, it's so important that we discover ourselves and then discover you, how wonderful and great you are, your faithfulness to us in spite of our mistakes, our doubts, our failures. We're so grateful, Father, that you don't throw us under the bus and discard us. You have a wonderful life design for us, and you're a wonderful teacher. We thank you that you control everything in the universe for our behalf, to conform us into the image of your Son, and Father, we thank you for the marvelous privilege of being in your presence tonight and just sharing your truth and finding things out that are so wonderful in your presence.